talk to you today about our pH sensor systems, uh, where we are, where we're coming from, and where we want to go uh, with them. So what is pH? Water exists as a combination of, it, it, it's continually associated and dissociating uh, hydroxyl, uh, hydronium ions, uh, and so it's not just this static H2O that's, that's there. Uh, we do have this dissociation uh, in and out, you know, we can have our usual H2O molecule, but then that can split into, the, into an OH and a hydrogen, uh, and then obviously it's, it's oversaturated H3O plus. And so pH is a measure of the concentration uh, of these hydronium ions in solution. So we're trying to see how much one way or the other uh, this uh, equilibrium is, is leaning. So pH uh, is a, the, the P and pH is a mathematical operator. It uh, stands for the uh, native log. Uh, it's the native log of the activity of the hydrogen uh, ions in, uh, in solution, which the activity is very close to concentration. So a low pH would suggest a higher hydronium ion activity. Uh, and we see here a typical scale of uh, things uh, that are acidic that were common, uh, like lemons and vinegar and whatnot, and then ammonia drank cleaning up on the high end, which on the high end there would suggest more of a hydroxide uh, activity. And the biological range that we're mainly concerned with is a five to nine right in here. Things like blood and food and uh, things like that. So that's really uh, our focus um, on that range. We can go outside of that range, but uh, for so many applications uh, that do involve uh, living things or biological systems, you end up killing things off when you get into those extreme uh, cases. So where is pH a concern? Really almost everywhere. Life sciences, things like cell culture, blood, uh, bioreactor monitoring. Uh, marine research monitoring, uh, the uh, downtown St. Petersburg Pier Aquarium just bought, or about, I think last summer they bought uh, a pH system to monitor uh, their seawater for all their aquariums and stuff. So, you know, not just home aquariums, but, you know, big ones, uh, Monterey Bay and things like that. You could uh, definitely use this for home and commercial use. Food and beverage processing, of course, as we saw on there. Pharmaceutical processing, we just recently achieved our USP Class 6 certification, which I'm going to be talking about more in detail at the end of the presentation. Uh, it's a, a really great certification to be able to use our sensors in medical devices, implantable devices, drugs, uh, storage containers, things like that for more pharmaceutical uh, applications. Soil analysis, uh, we had a lot of interest from the Pacific Northwest National Labs, PNNL. Uh, for doing soil analysis, looking at pH, using our reflective patches. Uh, general manufacturing of, of everything, really. I mean, everything comes out of a plant, you know, that has a process stream that needs to monitor things like pH, O2, CO2, or whatever. Power plant cooling water, we had uh, we sold some probes to Jerry. That's uh, the Japanese Atomic Energy Research Institute. And uh, they were using our, our t technology for their cooling water, which is great because uh, power plant cooling water is very high purity, uh, you know, ultra pure, low salinity, no, no salinity essentially. Uh, so electrodes don't work. So the optical method was their, you know, alternative, their solution that we were able to provide to them uh, that got over uh, not having a high enough salinity to use the standard electrodes. Really everything. Everything comes from a plant or somewhere uh, that needs some sort of monitoring during that process. So methods of pH sensing, everyone's probably most familiar with just pH paper that you get, you know, it's just a dye uh, embedded in some paper. And it's just a quick general check to match up colors and have an idea of roughly in a range, you know, if you're just acidic or basic. Electrodes, that's the industry standard, essentially just a voltmeter, uh, looking at the um, potential difference between some reference. Uh, these have their pros and cons, of course, they're, they've been use so much that they're so cheap now, the electronics and all that, to, to do that, and they do cover the whole range. But some of their downsides include uh, the storage uh, requirements, so you have to store them in different solutions based on the length of storage. Uh, they're brittle, uh, they break easily. As I mentioned before, they require some level of salinity to have accurate measurements. Um, so they do have some drawbacks that our optical method uh, tries to solve. Uh, and then optodes, which is what we're doing, which is just sending light to some sort of 
chemistry that's uh, pH dependent or pH reactive and uh, then interacting with that and sending that light back to some sort of detector uh, to correlate to pH. So we can look at fluorescence lifetime, uh, intensity, or uh, colorimetric absorbance. In our case, we're going to look at, uh, at absorbance there. So here's this quick table kind of highlighting some of the major uh, aspects of, of these. So, you know, dynamic range, the electrode covers more so than the fluorescent or colorimetric optodes, uh, which are limited to around four pH units. If you go to other competition, you know, pre-sense, Polestar, they're doing the same thing. They're using a fluorescent dye, uh, pyronine, to uh, uh, look in a similar range, and it's right around that, that same uh, stretch. And uh, accuracy, you know, that depends on how good you want to make your electronics and, and the system. Uh, the cost, uh, electrodes, as I said, they're pretty cheap. The fluorescent optodes are expensive because you need phase barometers and all these uh, expensive electronics. Uh, the color metric that I'm going to be showing you guys uh, can be expensive or cheap. It depends. I mean, right now, the setup you have in front of you uh, uses USB 2000 and an LS1. Which costs, you know, combination around three thousand dollars or so. So that's really expensive electronics. But you can get away with just using uh, LEDs or one LED, and then maybe two or three photodiode detectors. So you can have really low cost electronics. Uh, we're looking into using the STS as a platform uh, for future pH electronics, uh, which isn't terribly low cost, but it lets us, it gives us a versatility to be able to use it with additional chemistries as they're being developed. So if we, you know, put ourselves in the box of we're going to use a photodiode detector with filters uh, that just hit 620 and just hit 750 nanometers, as soon as we develop a new chemistry, now we're stuck in a box where we can, we have to have different, you know, electronics for that as opposed to an STS which can just hit everywhere that we, that we would need it to see. So uh, the limitations too, as I said, a big one on uh, fluorescent is the photo bleaching drift. Um, they, uh, they are really no good for long-term, extremely long-term measurement because uh, it just bleaches out the same way uh, you know, ruthenium sensors do and stuff after a long time. Uh, the uh, uh, storage too, because if you leave them out, and they're exposed to uh, the light that would bleach them, then that, of course, is going to kill their life, too. So the colorimetric method, uh, that really overcomes the photo bleaching effect that, that uh, is a big drawback in the fluorescent. The, prob the main problem people have in, with the colorimetric that they try to stay away from is the color effect and the turbidity and ambient light, because with fluorescent, you're looking at uh, either phase shift or different things where you don't have to worry about uh, these other environmental influences. But with the uh, color metric, it does interfere, like with this dip probe. If I stuck that in mud, we're not going to get any signal. It's not going to work. So that's not a solution for soil analysis.